Ken and I, Ken and I kind of brainstormed and, and thought that we might like to present um, a little bit about where the music that we sing came from, where it, where it originated. And, uh, and, and how we got to where we are today. And um, because there, it's such a wide, um, a wide subject, there's so much subject matter, we divided it into two sessions. Uh, the first session today is going to be basically the history of where Christian music began and where it's come to. And then next week, we're going to really get into the juicy stuff, and we're going to talk about the philosophy of church music. So it'll, not next week, but in two weeks. Um, so so it, we have two sessions, and we hope you'll join us for both. And uh, we've done a PowerPoint presentation, and we have some sound clips. So... Um, I hope you enjoy it, and uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Take it away, Ken. All right. Uh, well, first, the disclaimer that, uh, yes, we uh, <laughs> we hereby declare we do not own the rights to the following music song, et cetera, et cetera, and this is for uh, uh, educational and informational purposes only. So, uh, Deb mentioned philosophy, and we thought we'd begin and end with that, and just a, a few notes on this. And uh, I found this, which is... Uh, Describing the purpose of church uh, worship and corporate worship, and, uh, uh, you know, philosophically, and uh, that loans itself so well to this whole enterprise. And as she hinted, next next week we're really going to get into this and and begin to pick this apart, as it describes uh, all saints. Uh, but just these four principles: uh, the first being the purpose of corporate worship uh, is to provide a way and means for people of God to have a communion with God, and it's. Uh, Really, more than that, to connect, I think, on a, on a deeper level. And as uh, I think we know and understand, music really helps that. Uh, music uh, both uh, expresses and uh, also affects, you know, our emotions and, and all of that. It it helps us grow uh, closer to God, opens us up to that uh, that communion. Um, second, the purpose of uh, corporate worship is to provide structure and language uh, for people so they can describe and access that connection in, in, in a more tangible way. And again, music certainly, uh, you know, carries that uh, of all the art forms that uh, we might employ uh, in worship. And that could be, uh, you know, uh, paintings, murals on the wall or uh, statuary and what have you. Uh, it's uh, it's music that, uh, you know, uh, especially has that ability to uh, uh, to uh, give us the words, and uh, and in a very nice way, a very uh, pleasing way, aesthetically, uh, to uh, to describe and uh, and connect. Uh, third, the purpose of church worship is edification, uh, to encourage one another and build each other up. And uh, music again does the same thing. And what, what came to mind to me immediately was if you think of movements throughout history, and uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, in particular, stands out for me. And if you think about it, that had a soundtrack. Uh, you know, we shall overcome, guide my feet, lift every voice and sing. And music has that power to unite and lift people to uh, uh, to new possibilities. Uh, it, it helps uh, encourage and inspire, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, the body of Christ as we think of it in, in, in context of music. And because, uh, you know, the movements have, have soundtracks, but what we'll get into a little deeper next week is that individuals uh, have soundtracks as well. Uh, it's why you have a favorite hymn, although you may not know why it is your favorite. Uh, it's, and it's not just the tune or lyrics, but something that goes much deeper into the construct of your very soul, uh, hence the term soul music. Uh, and as I said, it could be a hymn, it could be a piece of classical music or a folk tune or a jazz piece or something that really rocks. And as I said, well, we're really going to open that up next week as we talk about uh, how we select music for, uh, for worship. And finally, uh, the purpose of church worship is to help change and transform the worshiper. And again, music is that, that thing that has the ability to go deeper, faster, quicker than anything else and, and, and inspire you and stay with you. Uh, again, those words and feelings, uh, you know, in the words of a favorite song and tune, you know, just you, you carry those with you. And uh, they're with you all, you know, all through your life. And I'm sure there are times when a song just pops into your head uh, that, uh, you know, has some, uh, some well, as long as it isn't, uh, you know, it's a small world after all, which pops into my head at the wrong times. <laughs> but but other things, uh, you know, that, that are just there for you. Uh, you hear a song on the radio and it suddenly takes you someplace. And 
all of that is uh, it's just the power of music and why it is so critical uh, i think uh, for worship and as i said we'll we'll talk more about that piece of it uh, next week which i i think will really be interesting so uh as, as most of you probably know, sacred music as we know it began centuries before Christianity existed. Um, and it was likely in the form of chant in the Jewish tradition in temples and synagogues. And that, that type of chant would have been either led by someone or it would have been in unison. So it would have been like one voice. And that too, like Ken said, kind of touches your soul because you're, you're one voice ab around one subject. Um, after what, after Christianity kind of got a hold, and as I say here, a mere two centuries later, um, sacred music had evolved, and uh, there was still in unison or monophonic singing. Uh, from the first through the fourth centuries, this was what was normal in most of the Christian churches that were formed. And we know, uh, according to uh, St. Paul's letters in the New Testament, that he encouraged the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And the, the quote that I, that I listed here from uh, Colossians is, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So music is, is not only a way to come together, it's also a way to be closer to God. And somewhere along the way, worship included the addition of musical instruments. Um, and King David in his Psalms said it perfectly, let uh, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipes. So he was, he was saying clanging cymbals and loud crashing cymbals, you know, it, it was everything it was like, you know, make a joyful noise to the Lord. So that was, uh, that was what the, um, where that was around probably in the time of the New Testament. And then um, instrumental music was rejected a little later on and me because musical instruments were associated with sin. Uh, they thought they were inappropriate for inclusion in worship because they were thought to be very self-indulgent. Uh, one of the examples that's still in our hymnal of that kind of music is uh, this Christmas hymn called uh, Of the Father's Love Begotten, uh, which goes, Of the Father's Love Begotten. And you can just imagine a whole group of people singing that together as, uh, as one voice again. Uh, between the 2nd and 4th centuries, antiphonal psalmody uh, became popular, which was responsorial. So basically, one person would sing a phrase and the congregation would repeat it. And we do that occasionally now. We still uh, sing that kind, of, uh, that kind of hymn in church um, occasionally uh, when, you know, when we're able to get together. So uh, yeah. um, that's, uh, that is, is how it sort of evolved, and we have a little sound clip for you to hear. So while Ken's, Ken's adjusting that, I'll, uh, I'll continue. Um, Christianity is continuing to evolve, and it's spreading all over the world. It's starting to go into different areas across the Mediterranean. Uh, the Roman church is taking a hold. And the next slide you see will show... Just uh, a second. Yeah, something, something that's, um, that, that a lot of people use today as very relaxing music, which is Gregorian chant. And that's, uh, you know, just, it's very calming. It's very, um, it's, it's in unison. So it's, it's very, you know, there's not a lot of, not a lot of noise, not a lot of motion. Um, this in the ninth century, the Roman Church uh, began this specific form, which was attributed to Pope Gregory the Great. And like I say, Roman Ch uh, Gregorian chant is still popular today, and we have a little clip of that. And that one should end on its own, hopefully. <laughs>
Is it going to play? It should be. Let's see. So that's Gregorian chant. And then in uh, 1054, there was something called the Great Schism, which divided the church into the Roman church, the Christian church, into the Roman church and the Orthodox church. And music became more specific to the individual denominations. And plain song is something that developed from Gregorian chant. And it's still typical today in the Western church. And the sound clip that we have for you to listen to um, for plain song was actually recorded at Virginia Theological Seminary. So this is this is plain song and this is sung today, you know, in these times. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. So that's plain song. You can see the similarity between the Gregorian chant and the plain song. And remarkably, you know, over um, 1,200 years, those those music forms have carried through, and they're still a part of of our of our musical being. Uh, the evolution of sac sacred music was a rather slow process, as you can see. It took you know, 1,200 years, and we're still using some of that music from way back when. Uh, took another 300 years for polyphony, which is rounds, canons, and fugues, to develop and to be accepted for religious use. Um, or, you know what a round is, like row, row, row your boat. Well, Thomas Tallis um, is, is one of the more familiar ones, and we've sung this in church with, with lyrics to it um, so you'll you'll just hear the melody here but you can imagine after a couple notes coming in with the round part Um, you recognize that if you've been to the 1030 church, we've done it a number of times. Polyphony emerged out of the medieval church music, which was chant still, around the 12th century with the invention of organum, which is a plain chant melody with at least one added voice. So what, what we're doing here, instead of layering the melody over top of each other, what we're doing is we're adding harmony with organum. So the next clip you will hear is the organum with, with harmony. Uh, other things that were happening at the, uh, you know, during uh, during this time, the invention of the printing press in uh, in 1440, uh, we thought we uh, might give mention to this because uh, not only uh, did it have an impact uh, on on the church and undermining uh, the Catholic Church, uh, particularly coming along in time for Luther uh, to uh, take full advantage of it, uh, but it disrupted the religious culture as well. Uh, as it says here, it gave great opportunity uh, to those who. Um, 
uh, you know, uh, freedom for, you know, for uh, composers uh, gave them a, an outlet by which, uh, you know, volumes of music could be produced and shared uh, and uh, could be preserved uh, for future generations, uh, as it says, an example of that uh, just there on the right. And uh, it really helped not only in, uh, you know, the Reformation uh, in, in its uh, in its formation uh, and, and, and its uh, uh, the foothold that it took, uh, again, dividing Christendom into even further, uh, you know, uh, you know, pieces and, and a sample of uh, uh, music that's now uh, widely distributed. Um, and uh, as it says here, you know, the, the Reformation uh, led to more than a division in theology. It really did influence uh, the types and styles of music. Uh, and we'll see that in, in various uh, various places. We talk a little bit more about uh, Luther and the uh, Reformation on the continent and also the English Reformation. Uh, but as uh, Deb described, uh, before Enduring, you had uh, Catholic worship, which was uh, uh, the choral works, Gregorian, plain chant, responsive. Protestant reformers split into two schools of church music. Uh, one is normative and regulative, uh, the normative principle and the regulative principle. And uh, we're going to bang the normative to death in the next uh, next two weeks. But the regulative principle of worship maintains that Scripture gives specific guidelines for uh, conducting corporate worship services and that churches must adhere to those guidelines and not add anything to them, the Word of God being of primary importance. For example, singing of psalms, which is uh, certainly called for in the Old and, uh, and New Testaments in the writings we have. Uh, the normative principle really comes from Luther, and the next slide will uh, uh, will show you his quote, and uh, it certainly is normative, uh, you know, for us uh, at All Saints. Uh, and and by the way, of all the reformers, Luther uh, probably was the uh, the most appreciative of music and the power of music. Uh, um, People may not know this. Yes, he was a friar, only trying to save himself, and uh, did not intend to begin this. Uh, uh, this theological upheaval, although he was just actually joining uh, a Reformation movement that had begun centuries earlier. Uh, but he was um, he was a musician. Uh, he was a singer. Uh, only his friends knew, but he played the lute mm -hmm. and also a composer. And uh, Luther um, once said that, uh, you know, it was important. Uh, musical skills were the most important tool for promoting uh, the teachings of the Reformation and of the gospel. And uh, there's a quote that he said, and I've got it here. I always love music, and whoso has skill in this art is of a good temperament, fitted for all things. We must, we must teach music in all the schools. A schoolmaster ought to have skill in music, or I would not regard him. Neither should we ordain any young men as preachers, unless they have been well exercised in music. And he said, uh, the normative principle, and, and this is what uh, Luther had said or described it. And uh, the quote is, what the scripture forbids not, it allows. And what it allows is not unlawful, and what is not unlawful may lawfully be done. These are like the uh, rubrics in the prayer book, uh, you might say. Uh, but this doctrine gives to its followers great artistic and creative freedom in organizing worship services and composing hymns. Uh, it's a way of saying, that, you know, that uh, at least liturgically, all bets are off. Uh, and uh, Luther himself, uh, quite a prolific hymn writer, uh, the dates of his uh, production uh, listed there. Uh, and the earliest Lutheran hymnal uh, comes out as early as, as 1524, uh, the Achliederbuch. Uh, and uh, in it, there are eight hymns by Luther and uh, another few by Paul Asperitus. And uh, Luther himself wrote 37 hymns, uh, most of which survive today, uh, though um, perhaps there were additional texts uh, which uh, were passed around informally. Some of his uh, greatest hits uh, were uh, Savior of the Nations Come, uh, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come, uh, We All Believe in One True God, and uh, one you may have heard uh, that goes like this. But anyway, um, the thing about Luther is uh, the popular uh, 
story about him is that uh, many of his hymns were uh, based on uh, bar tunes or drinking songs, hence the uh, painting of the uh, German uh, tavern in the uh, 16th century uh, here to the left. Uh, and, uh, and that's not true. Uh, it, it's certainly true that he uh, may have uh, borrowed from some popular tunes of his time. And uh, in doing that, uh, the musical terminology would, would, would then uh, be referred, referred to these hymns as being in bar form. So, uh, you know, we may have gotten that notion from that, but there, there's no actual evidence that there were German drinking songs, particularly to the tune of uh, Einfeste Borg uh, that uh, Luther was, uh, was applying uh, lyrics to. Uh, so uh, it's not true. <laughs> so moving right along, um, hymn writing and other forms of church music associated with Protestantism continued to develop and progress. Um, some of the milestones in the progression of sacred music in the 16th and 17th centuries are that secular music began to have more influence on church music, the Anglican church was formed and Anglican chant developed, the organ became a popular church instrument, the vernacular was introduced into liturgy and music, thus breaking away from the speaking and singing in Latin. Uh, metrical psalms led to hymns which become more popular, and many great composers made important contributions to sacred music. And of course, you've heard of Johann Bach, Johann Pachelbel, Felix Mendelssohn, those, you know, they all wrote sacred music, which was, was actually a, a very popular music form at the time. Now over on the right, there are a couple of photos of um, organs. The one at the top, the smaller one, is a reproduction of an organ. Um, a, a small, what they call a table organ. And then the bottom one is an actual um, 16th century organ. And uh, you'll notice something on both of those that they have a bellows on them. Um, and what, does that remind you of a modern instrument? Anybody have any clue what that reminds you of? Yeah, Tammy's doing it, it's an accordion. So it's very similar. And um, <laughs> the, these, these organs relied on wind pressure and they were powered by these bellows. Some of the larger organs, you can see all those pipes, they need a lot of wind to be able to produce sound. Um, and the one, I don't know if that's the one that's, but another one that uh, we had a clip for that, that didn't make it through, um, had 20 bellows on it to power all of the pipes, which required 20 men to operate those bellows. So every time they had a church service with an organ playing, they'd have 20 men to, to operate those bellows to keep the organ playing. So that was, um, that was a lot of dedication. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the accordion. I was thinking of the evil twin of the organ, which is the bagpipe. So. <laughs> oh yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, <there's, laughs> yeah, that only and, takes that only takes one man to keep the. Uh, yeah, and the actually, airborne. in one of the uh, one of the playing for change songs that we've seen, um, there are some musicians that use uh, an organ type instrument that has a bellows on it, and you can see them, you know, operating the bellows to make the air go through so that the sound comes out. So that, that's uh, where the organ began. And, you know, of course, now it's, it's gone on to electronic instruments. Yeah, and we have this clip that you sent, uh, Deb, this uh, video. Is yeah, that, uh... yeah it's, it's pretty interesting. Hi, we are at the 16th century organ in Uttum in the region of Krumhörn in Germany, in Ostfriesland. And this organ remained pretty much intact since the time of the Reformation. So I always start with the principal eight. It's a little bit hard to pull. Very good. So I'm going to go with the quintet in a sixteen. That, that's pretty interesting that that was an actual 16th century organ that he was playing. So. Right. 
Uh, and again, just uh, highlights as we make our way around the continent and uh, through Europe. Uh, of course, there's the uh, Book of Common Prayer and the uh, English Reformation, uh, which um, oversaw, again, a proliferation of English uh, Protestant composers and the writing of many uh, English uh, Psalters. And, and we'll get a little bit more to this in a moment. Uh, we had the uh, Prayer Book of 1549 and the Prayer Book of 1552 in their relationship. Uh, and just to mention what were the developments uh, within uh, uh, liturgies of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Church of England, uh, the 1549 edition, uh, or the original version of the Book of Common Prayer, uh, which, versions of which are still, and variations of which are still a part of uh, many of uh, the official liturgical books of, of the Church of England and other Anglican uh, uh, churches. Uh, this was uh, largely the work of Thomas Cranmer, who you see uh, there on the left, uh, who uh, really pulled it together from a large number of sources. Uh, his, uh, his theology certainly uh, bleeds through uh, the book, the Reformation theology. However, uh, he still maintains uh, the traditional forms uh, and uh, a lot of the sacramental language, uh, which comes over from the medieval uh, Catholic liturgies. Um, it was criticized by uh, many uh, who were a little further left than he was in the uh, uh, progression of the, uh, of the uh, church's theology in England, and it was replaced by a, a new edition, a significantly different uh, edition in 1552. And uh, as we said, um, the uh, English composers now that, that, that begin to operate, uh, uh, this too is in large part a reaction against the, uh, just the Catholic worship music. Uh, and it was particularly uh, denounced uh, because it was uh, it was in Latin, and uh, one of the things about the Book of Common Prayer is that it was it was given in the common language, and uh, music began to uh, to follow that. And if you're going to translate it, if you're going to go from uh, Latin to English, you might as well change some of the other forms as well. And uh, the composers in England began to uh, develop a unique uh, canon of uh, of English worship music, which was quite. Uh, uh, different from uh, the music being played on the, uh, the continent. And among our gifts is the Anglican chant. <laughs> yeah, and the Anglican chant um, came along, at, you know, as the, as the Anglican church um, sort of proliferated. And Anglican chant is a way to sing unmetrical sex texts. Um, the, um, Music had progressed to a point where um, metrics, in other words, something in a very, very even meter, very even tempo, um, had become popular. In doing Anglican chant, basically what you're doing is you're singing a psalm or a canticle from the Bible by matching your natural speech rhythm to music, uh, to the notes of a simple harmonized melody. And in Anglican chant, the natural rhythm of the words as they would be spoken by a, a careful speaker governs how the music is fitted to the words. Um, we do this occasionally. We, we, our typical time to do uh, Anglican chant type uh, psalms and things is in either Advent or Lent. Uh, the majority of the words here are freely and rhythm rhythmically chanted over the reciting notes. And a reciting note is where you say a whole bunch of words on one, one tone, one note. And with the other notes of the music appropriately fitted to the words at the end of each half verse. So you're, there are like two sections to an Anglican Anglican chant. We still sing Anglican chant and there are settings for uh, Anglican chant in our hymnal and they're very popular in a lot of churches still. And we have a little clip for you which we may have to stop again. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> and then we, we move along to um, it, it explaining a little more about what metrical psalms and hymns are. And the two most important developments that contributed to Western church music and hymnody as we know it today are meter and harmony. And we've seen 
previously where meter came in and where harmony came in. Meter or metrical structure is a rhythmic pattern of basic units like what we call beats that are grouped into regular measures or bars. And harmony is defined as the sound of two or more notes that are heard simultaneously. Because hymn lyrics are frequently based on poetry, there's, there are often options for interchanging hymn melodies with the lyrics which follow the same rhythmic patterns. And our hymnal, in the back of our hymnal, there's an index in the back for uh, interchanging these tunes and lyrics according to their meter. And if you look at the example that's given there, the hymn tune Old Hundredth, which was composed, by the way, in the year 1551, um, you can you can see how the uh, the meter um, follows a pattern. If you count it on your fingers, it's praise God from whom all blessings flow. So that's eight syllables. So that line has eight syllables, and there are two lines of those same um, four those same syllables. So there are four lines with eight syllables each, which is called long meter. So that's um, there are different meters, but a lot of times underneath the hymn you'll see numbers like 10.11.10.11. So there are 10 syllables in the first phrase, 11 syllables in the second phrase, 10 syllables in the next phrase, and 11 syllables in the following phrase. And you can interchange melodies that have that same pattern with different words. And we do that very frequently at All Saints. Yeah, we do. Uh, we'll find a hymn that we think we really want to sing this because of the season or, or what we think is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the message or how it, uh, how it connects to this text or that. And we'll look at it and say, nobody knows this hymn. So we go scurrying through <laughs> the other tunes until we find something. Oh, wow. You may have noticed that if you come to the late service, we sing a lot of stuff to the uh, servant song and uh, other tunes <laughs> that, uh, that, we know, uh, that we know pretty well. But here's the uh, clip of the old hundredth. Very nice. Um, just a quick look at, at some of the uh, English, uh, you know, composers who uh, really stand out. Uh, there's Benjamin Keach, uh, is one who uh, really popularized. And this is a, a, a particular Baptist, uh, not a, a member of the Church of England, uh, but was essential in the, the popularization of uh, hymns in English churches. And um, he uh, was a contemporary of someone else you may have heard of, uh, Isaac Watts who uh, is known as the uh, father of English hymnody, although he's also been referred to as the godfather of English hymnody, and that's for the, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into that part of his senior side of his life as godfather. But uh, he's one that um, really, uh, you know, blew the doors off the building, if you will, as far as uh, our worship is concerned. Uh, over 750 hymns are credited to Isaac Watts. Uh, Deb, how many are in our... Uh, the 1982 hymnal, I think you had a number. Uh, I think there were around 20 or so. Yeah. But uh, incredibly prolific. Uh, Joy to the World, uh, which is based on uh, Psalm 98, is one of his oldies but goodies. Uh, uh, Come Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove, when I survey the wondrous cross, alas, and did my Savior bleed. Uh, and, and this one. That's good. And just paying attention to time, uh, Henry Purcell, I also need to mention, the um, chant that we did earlier, the Anglican chant, was based on uh, one of Purcell's uh, uh, offerings. 
Uh, his quote is, as poetry is to the harmony of words, so music is to that of notes, and as poetry is a rise above prose and oratory, so is music and the exaltation of poetry. Uh, Purcell has some hymns, but he's mostly known for the uh, 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 liturgical music and, and offerings that uh, he placed together. Uh, perhaps we're going to get a sampling of one of his more uh, uh, famous uh, pieces, uh, which is a Tadeum that he wrote for uh, St. Cecilia's Day in uh, 1694, uh, Tadeum Laudamus. Uh, that's the Latin, we praise thee, O God. And uh, it's, uh, it's it's just a song of thanksgiving, a song of praise that normally would be sung uh, uh, during morning prayer. Uh, but here's a quick sampling. Very nice. <laughs> and, and in addition to, if you go back again, Ken? Yes. In, in addition to, just to Purcell, um, in addition to that, Purcell began, um, he began composing music at the ripe old age of nine years old. He only lived to be 36. So he was a very prolific, um, gifted composer. He was primarily an organist. And he is buried in um, buried in Westminster Abbey next to the um, the chapel there because he was the the organist. He was honored to be the organist at Westminster Abbey, and he is compared to be equal with Bach, Handel, Beethoven. If you've ever heard the song "Trumpet Voluntary" at a wedding, da 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 da, da that's Purcell. All right, moving right along. So in uh, the early 18th century, John Wesley with his brother Charles began a movement to try to change the, Urch the Church of England. Um, they formed something called the Holy Club that was established at the University of Oxford. This group uh, focused primarily on living a holy life and were, they were given a, a name by uh, some of their fellow students because they were sort of different and they, they called them Methodists because they used rule and method in their religious work. And although this title was intended as mockery, the, the, the name Methodist was turned into a title of honor by John, who was the leader of the club. So that's where the, the Methodist um, title came from and eventually the Methodist religion. And uh, now John and Charles traveled to America to um, be missionaries. They were invited to come over there by General John Oglethorpe. And uh, they stayed for a while. They were only there for uh, a few years. And they, they went back to England because they felt they had failed. They didn't feel that they um, were, were fully into the Christian faith, that they felt that they were lacking. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then eventually both of the brothers uh, had a conversion. They had an e evangelical conversion, <clears throat> excuse me, and they proceeded to uh, try to reach people that were, they felt were neglected by the Church of England. And uh, in 1784, John Wesley ordained ministers and he sent them to America. And by the time of his death in 1791, there were over 500 Methodist ministers in England and America. <clears throat> Excuse me, gotta get a drink. <clears throat> and one, um, one exciting thing that I found was that early Methodism allowed women to have authority in church worship. And that, we know, we know that changed over time. <clears throat> okay, next slide. And uh, the, the one of the Wesley brothers who really had the most influence on church music was Charles Wesley. He was very prolific. And Ken, I'm going to up your uh, 
your uh, Isaac Watts number there because, um, <clears throat> as we'll see on the next slide, Charles Wesley had uh, many more hymns attributed to him than uh, Isaac Watts did. <clears throat> yes, but we frown on Methodist hymns. <laughs> yeah, well, he was, he was a great prolific. Well, don't frown too much. Okay, I know. Uh, most of Wesley's hymns are very distinct. They have a very strong doctrinal content, uh, especially the universal universality of God's love. They have rich script scriptural and literary allusion, and they have variety in metrical and stanza forms. So his hymns aren't all the same, so <clears throat> you wouldn't naturally assume that a hymn belongs to Charles Wesley if you heard it, just because he had a lot of variety. <clears throat> uh, he had a conversion experience in 1738, a little before his brother, um, but he communicated his message through his, his writing. Um, his doctrines included the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and the depravity of mankind and humanity's personal accountability to God. So in, additional, and in, in addition to his original hymns, he also produced paraphrases of Psalms, and uh, those, those followed in the long tradition of English metrical psalmody. And uh, in the course of his career, Wesley published the words of between 6,500 and 10,000 hymns. That's a lot of hymns. <laughs> At least 150 are included in the Methodist hymnals. And in our hymnal 1982, there are 21 hymns with lyrics by Charles Wesley. And some of the ones that are more familiar, you can, you can see the list there that some of those we sing very regularly. Christ the Lord is risen today, we just sang at Easter. And, uh, you know, a lot of those are very familiar and they have carried over uh, since the 1800s. Uh, if we talk about uh, music uh, being something that cuts to the heart of the matter and, uh, and, and tells a story that, uh, you know, our story and, and becomes uh, our soundtrack, uh, spiritual certainly, uh, certainly fit into that uh, category. And this is a uh, we should devote a whole uh, session just uh, on these alone and the whole idea of story. Uh, but spirituals are uh, purely and solely uh, the creation of, uh, of African Americans, and it's a, a merging of uh, uh, the African culture that they knew uh, with the experiences of uh, being held in bondage. Uh, at first, during uh, just the uh, transatlantic uh, you know, trade days and uh, uh, moving into the um, domestic slave trade uh, that uh, that ensued and uh, they encompass uh, you know the sing song that you might have uh, you know as as, uh, as slaves labored uh, uh, songs not just to get them through the day but that that contained that uh, that hopeful message uh, you know we are climbing Jacob's ladder is not about uh, climbing a ladder uh, not at all and um, again uh, you know Prior to uh, and uh, you know moving up to the end of the Civil War, I mean, uh, and and finally emancipation, it's spiritual. You know, spirituals are really a way of uh, passing on uh, that. It's it's oral tradition, but it's passing along this message of hope and of uh, of, of determination, uh, and and just getting that uh, uh, you know uh, spread from uh, one to the next, one to the next, and uh, just uh, as I said, we should probably devote. Uh, just a whole uh, a whole morning to uh, to, to talking about uh, the spirituals and their uh, their influence and uh, and whatnot. But here's a, a just a, a brief sampling of one. When Israel was in Egypt's land. Let my people go, oppressed so hard. Hey, if you thought this was about Passover, this hymn, you got another Let thing coming. My people go, go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell Saith the Lord, bold Moses said, Let my people go. And 
sake of time, and we knew it would come to this, so we only have a couple minutes left, but uh, uh, we'll just kind of, uh, you know, move through uh, developments uh, in the 20th century that have also been incredibly influential. Uh, in 1938, uh, the Iona community, uh, you know, forms and uh, gives us, uh, again, uh, their own unique, uh, you know, uh, form of worship and uh, music, uh, again, included in that. Uh, you know, another form of, uh, of plain song, I would describe it. Uh, the Tizay community also uh, begins to take shape in 1940, which is an ecumenical community. And again, developing their own style of music, some of which we have used at, at All Saints. And here's a sampling of, uh, of one piece of Tizay. which the form is, it's very repetitive and just builds the parts. And oftentimes you have a cantor that will take a solo part uh, while the uh, other lyrics are repeated. Spirit of Sanctus, uh, invoking the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, quickly again, uh, 1956, uh, the first the first folk mass using a piano instead of an organ. I can't believe they would allow a piano in the church. Uh, there's the whole Vatican II experience. Uh, you can see the evolution. And again, in the Episcopal Church, it's not just the prayer books uh, that uh, that come along, but there's a new freedom that uh, suddenly is present as we uh, move from the 28th version to the 79th version. Uh, the many supplements to that, even, that we've had. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember the alternative service book uh, that was uh, around in the 60s and 70s. I don't because I was a Lutheran then, but... Uh, you still have one in the organ bed. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly, uh, and as we move further along, uh, as we get into uh, the 1980s, uh, there's more and more contemporary choral music that's, that's being uh, uh, produced, uh, commissioning of, of new works, uh, influence of jazz, for example, in this one. This is a Curie. See, all you can see at the end of that is, Lord have mercy. Right. <laughs> Very funny. But anyway, and, uh, you know, uh, new instruments are introduced into the church. Our, our band never looked quite like that, but man, that's, that was something to shoot for. And uh, new instruments that are introduced and accepted. And uh, just a, an incredible variety of, uh, of music that uh, now has found its way into church, which is, I guess, where... Uh, we are kind of sitting at, uh, at All Saints uh, for, uh, again, being a small rural parish, we have one of the most uh, diverse uh, and eclectic uh, music programs I think I've ever encountered. Uh, but, uh, Deb, closing words from you here before we fire it open for questions. Well, one thing I just wanted to say is uh, Veni Sancti Spiritus, which you just heard on the last slide, uh, look for that in two weeks on Pentecost, because that, that we'll be using it then. So, um, and... Uh, we, we really appreciate you coming today and listening to our little presentation about the history of church music. And we hope you will join us in two weeks when we explore the philosophy of, of that music and um, how, it, how it actually became a part of our, our regular worship and, and where it goes, how it touches your soul, that sort of thing. And also wanted to show you, I own a 1562 prayer book from the Church of England. So wow. this has has all of the has all of the ancient language in it and everything. So wow, and, <laughs> and, it also and, has and in it. Yeah, and uh, before you, just some, if you have any questions, just want to you know talk a little bit you know about some of this. We realize this was just a rush through. 
and uh, kind of hitting the highlights, you know, Hymnody's greatest hits, uh, if you will, <laughs> just trying to show some of the influences. And again, we didn't spend a lot of time with it, but I hope you could see, you know, the difference just in our roots as Anglicans, uh, just, uh, you know, th th that unique style that develops uh, uh, in England with Purcell and with Watts and others. Uh, that there, there is a dis distinctly British sound uh, that, uh, that uh, is certainly a part of our influence. And also the influences of other, um, you know, other other genres, uh, particularly uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, the spiritual and, and, and other uh, forms and the spiritual itself giving birth to jazz and gospel and uh, and those forms. So it's uh, it's really quite intricate. And in uh, and, and again, in two weeks, we'll talk about how we put all this together. And it's really I guess it's inviting you into the. Uh, you know the the worship room to say how do we how do we begin to you know put this together? But really, something to be thinking about is again think about music that is most important to you. I mean, what's what's the song you, you find yourself singing when you're you know puttering around the kitchen or doing this or doing that? And I will guarantee it may or may not be a hymn, but <laughs> but there's something about that song that is part of your story and and on that deeper level. Uh, really, you know, you know, conveys your, you know, your relationship to others, to God, to all that surrounds you. It's all couched in there. So, yeah, well, I, uh, Dev and Ken, thank you very much. This has really been very interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I think Joe, you had a question. Joe Klausner, the real musician, who should have been doing this with Deb and not I, but that's <laughs> no. no, not at all. Yeah, my question was on the first on the Anglican chant that you played was beautiful. Did, did you have the composer on the PowerPoint? I can go back and play that was, it. Uh, well, it was Purcell was the uh, composer. It was, it was Henry Purcell for all that, yeah. that arrangement, I think was not Purcellian, but, but um, no, it was, it was a more modern. But yeah. It, I'd like to know who, who arranged that. That was way we're going, we're going back exactly, here. Let's see. Exactly listed on the music. Yes. Also, mm -hmm. My other question was on the, Gregorian chants you're playing, there were women singing, but there were, I'm pretty sure there were women were not allowed to sing. No, that Gregorian was chant. when did they when did they start to allow women to um sing uh, in the church? Do you do you do you recall in the, in your research? I don't know an exact time, but I know that it probably was not until, you know, like post-Renaissance would, would be my guess. Gotcha. Yeah, the uh, old hundredth was actually um, the tune was written by Thomas Ken in seventeen yeah. So the tune was a little later than the lyrics of old hundredth. Yeah. But I was looking at the actual Anglican chant was uh, uh, derived. It's Purcell, but it's uh, uh, Jay Turrell who was uh, adapting that. But, oh, great! A Purcell that, melody. Yeah. So, so it's yeah, it's actually. Um, that that's actually a psalm that that's been put to music. Great, it's very beautiful. Thank you guys. It's great job, great research. I'm looking forward to going back and and uh, reading, more, going back and seeing the PowerPoint so I can gra grasp it a little bit more. Looking forward to the future ones coming up too. Thank you, Deb. Do you make up the your your own rhythm when it comes to like spoken words? You'd spoken about that earlier. Um, Talking about the song. When we chant the psalm, yes. There, yes. There, you, you, when you when you chant a psalm, um, you you chant it to what's called a reciting note. So there's one note that's meant for this section of lyrics, and then the next section of lyrics has another note. So basically, what you're doing is you're fitting the words into that one note until it's time oh. to change to the next note. Oh, and, that's cool. And, and and it's called pointing. And what they do is they they mark the, the text. You'll see like a little dash or a, a dot or something above um, a phrase. And that phrase matches to that note. And then when you come to this little symbol, it's time to change to the next note. So basically it, it follows a pattern, but you're just fitting the words in for each verse to those notes. Who decides the changes in music? Like who decides what we sing each week? Uh, Deb and I do. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. And we keep telling you we take requests, but again, it has to, it has to pass several tests. Okay. And uh, you know, one of the tests is, uh, you know, does it um, 
does it address something in in the texts or you know ideally it's uh, and and when I'm preaching I can pretty much steer it because I know where I'm going and right. uh, so we want the music to kind of reinforce that or maybe even go a little deeper to take it to the next you know okay. the next spot yeah and what's what's really been interesting the past um, few times that we've had had a guest preacher the song that we had inserted as a sermon hymn just fit so seamlessly with their sermon. It's like we had ESP as to what they were huh. going to do, yeah. what they were going to talk about. <laughs> Tammy, could I add yeah. just quickly? Uh, I was looking up spirituals, Tammy, and uh, if you go to the Library of Congress, there's actually a web page on spirituals. It's really, really fascinating and informative. It gives the history of it, and then a lot of links to other things with regards to spirituals. But if you wanted to do something that's a good start, the Library of Congress uh, webpage on spirituals. Well, this was informative and I look forward to the next one. So thank you so much and everybody have a great day. Thank right. you. Thank you.